All right, guys. Today we're going to be reading The Boy Who Saved Baseball by John H. Ritter. So go ahead and turn to that first page in your packet where the story begins on page 168. Make sure you're tracking and following along with your finger. That way it's really easy to know where I'm reading and where you need to be reading as well. I'm going to start at the very top where it says local landowner. Local landowner Doc Adelmeyer has promised his neighbors in Dillontown that he won't sell his land to a group of developers headed by Alabaster Jones on one condition. Young Tom Gallagher's baseball team, the Dillontown Wildcats, will have to do what they've never done before, beat the all-star team from the camp down in Lakeview Mesa. The task seems impossible until two things happen. A multi-talented player, Cruz De La Cruz, joins the Wildcats camp and Cruz and Tom managed to persuade the gruff former star major leaguer Dante Del Gato to their coach, to be their coach. Over just a week, the team has grown in confidence and ability. Tom has, has even developed a computerized batting practice program called Hit Sim to help the team get ready for the big game. First, the town, and now much of the country, is rooting for the Dillontown Wildcats. And halfway down the page. By now, droves of reporters and pho photographers and television crews roamed the grounds. The dirt roadway cutting through Doc's land and heading to the ballpark was jammed, both sides with satellite trucks, microwave trucks, radio vans, and SUVs. All around the ball field, news crews set up lawn chairs, coolers, tripods, and umbrellas. Some of the townspeople showed up with cookies and iced cold lemon, lemon berry tea for the press, serving a few opinions to them as well. After he'd finished hitting, Tom heard one Los Angeles newscaster begin his interview with Mrs. Gleason by saying, Folks, something phenomenal is happening in America today. There are more baseball games across the nation tonight than people have ever seen in years. From little hamlets like this one to the last weed field vacant lots in cities everywhere, the Wild West showdown flavor is of this big game has, fire, has fired up interests and imaginations all over this land. Just focus on your hitting and fielding, Delgado reminded everyone as the team finished its second round of batting practice. Hitting, fielding. Then came the sports network truck, and the players stopped what they were doing and start, stared as it all sank in. The Dillontown Wildcats were going national. Don't pay any attention, Delgado called from the pitcher's mound. Crying out loud, they got nothing better to do than hound a bunch of kids? Tom hustled out and sat atop the old stone wall in right field, pretending to be taking a break, while he spied on the guy from the sports network. How long he, he's going to pitch, fella? He asked Tom. One more hitter, then we're done. I'm on page 170. The reporter turned to a man with a camera on his shoulder, stepping out of the huge white truck. Roy! Only one more batter. Get down here! Then he slapped at his shirt pocket, retrieving a notebook and a pen. What's your name, partner? How old are you? What's it like to have a legend like Elgato Loco coaching your squad? Tom wanted to answer every question, but the last one reminded him that he needed to stay focused. Sorry, I can't talk now. Then he couldn't help himself. He had to know. Is that why you're here? All because of him? Oh no, don't you see, kid? This big game, your whole situation here, has caught the attention of the entire nation. It's David versus Goliath. It's loyalty versus the big bucks. The small market team fighting for its life against the big money boys. Who wants to come in and bulldoze right over them? It's a metaphor for the entire game of baseball. It is? I'm telling you, buddy, it's more than a metaphor. This could be a meta five. With that, he stabbed the pen back into his pocket, folded the notebook, and ran toward the cameraman, followed by another guy wrapped in headgear and holding a fury microphone on a pole. Luckily for the reporter and for everyone in the stands, the last batter was Cruz. Because he put on a show, Ramon, he called out, this one's for you. On the next pitch, he served up a low line into left field, two steps to the right of Ramon. Maria, get ready, he yelled. 
and the next one, a sharp ground ball, sizzled down the first base line. Maria snagged it on the short, short hop. The crowd wooed at how easily she made the play. By the time Cruz called Tom's name and sent him deep against the right field wall, hoots and whistles ripped out of the stands for both hitter and fielder. More than that, between pitches, Tom now heard a definite buzz of surprise, of discovery, and awe. What are you feeding him for breakfast, Gallagher? A box of Wheaties and a pound of nails? Every hitter had done well that day, better than usual. The fielders had all displayed fundamental improvement, even over yesterday. But Cruz's show was full of flair and finesse. He could not miss. Like a pool player, he called his shots, hitting any pitch, high or low, toward any player, hitting the ball as if it were standing still. Finally, the awesome display seemed to be sinking into the minds of the fans in the stands, particularly those like Doc, who, who had been there since Monday. The ballpark became a canyon of quiet, save for Cruz's roll call and the slap of the ball on his maplewood bat. Frankie, turn two! Frankie charged the hot grounder, stabbed it, tossed it to Tara at second, who relayed it to Maria at first, smooth as a mold of chocolate. Again, the crowd called out its admiration. Tom felt a giddy lightheadedness as he watched. For the first time, he felt happy to be here. Tara, running back to second, smiled and gave him thumbs up. At the end of practice, the low voices in the dugout and the serious looks of quiet confidence on the faces of the other players only convinced Tom's suspicions that they felt it too. We got half a chance, said Ramon. Yeah, added Rachel. There it was. The team's two quietest players had spoken the words no one else had dared to say. I'm at the top of page 173. Grab all your stuff, Delgado growled, bringing a bucket of balls in from the mound. We're going to jog out of here, and if those reporters come swarming around you, well, you know the drill. The players rose and fil filed out of the drug dugout. They started through the crowd and back to camp, except for one. Tom lingered behind, sitting alone on the old pine bench. He wanted to savor the thrill of this moment. He wanted to allow everything that had happened to sink in. He let his thoughts fly loose like leaves in the wind like sagebrush whizzing past his face as he ran through the hillside chaparral. Then he reached for the sports bag next to his feet, pulled out his dream, ske dream sketcher, and began to write. Images of newscasters, landowners, outsiders, and locals who came to root or gloat, hate or berate, f filled the movie screen of his mind. He painted the scenes and drawings and word pictures as fast as he could scratch. This awkward, ten-membered, twenty-legged caterpillar of a team cocooned for days in the school library and on a sunken baseball field, was now breaking out into butterfly beauty, putting on a show, catching everyone's eye. Tom pushed his pen long, longer the, along the paper, capturing the moment. He could still hear the roar, the drum beats. He could hear footsteps. He looked up. There stood Alabaster Jones. Well, Tom Gallagher, he said, just the man I'm looking for. He descended the dugout steps. You boys must think you're pretty smart. Tom only stared, afraid even to blink or breathe. Yes, sir, Mr. Jones continued. I heard all about what you and the Mexican boy did. Think you're some clever muchachos, don't you? Tom managed a slight shrug. Mr. Jones stepped closer, lowering his face into Tom's and grabbed the neck of his shirt. You ride off and bring back that no good disgrace of a human being to coach this team of miserable misfits. Get him to show you a little something about hitting, huh? Speak up! Mr. Delgado is not a disgrace. He has a lot of grace. The man twisted his fist, tightening Tom's shirt around his neck. Shut up! Now, I'm only saying this once, so listen good. If by hocus or by pocus you happen to win tomorrow and this land deal falls through, you will sincerely regret it. I have associations in this town who promise me that they will personally shut down Scrub Oak Community School, fire the staff, and make all you kids hike down and back each day to the Lakeview Mesa School if things don't go as planned. And why would we all do that? Simple lack of funds, my boy. It's big tax dollars you kids are playing with. Big money all around. You understand? He did. Instantly, Tom could see a whole chain of events like dominoes falling whack 
whap slap into each other. Either the Wildcats lose tomorrow or Tom's parents lose their jobs, then maybe even their home. Compared to that, a few houses up on the hill didn't seem so bad. Mr. Jones must have read the understanding on Tom's face. He let go of his shirt and smiled. Good, he said, because I can cause you more hurt than a heart, heart attack. He grinned so wide, his sunburned lips turned white. Tom stared back, blinking hard. But if Tom had learned anything during the past week, he'd learned when he had to speak up and when it was better to be silent. And now was a time to speak. We're not trying to hurt you, said Tom. We don't have anything against you at all. Why are you trying to hurt us? Oh, you poor, poor boy. Listen. If you win the game, you'll be hurting me far more than I could ever do to you, and I mean right here. He tapped his white sports jacket on the left side of his chest, in my wallet. Then Mr. Jones' face seemed to change, turning softer. Worry rose in his eyes. You see, son, I was once a lot like you. I was young. I had stars in my eyes. But what you don't understand is that in the game of life, money wins. Brains can only take you so far. Talent barely gets you in the door these days. But this, he held up his hand and rubbed his thumb against his first two fingers, this opens more doors than dynamite. With this, you have an instant respect, instant power. Mr. Jones turned, but he did not leave. He looked off toward Rattlesnake Ridge as if imagining what all this land would be like after he was done with it. Remember, he said, without money, and the wish for even more money. Columbus never would have sailed to America. Then where would we all be today? Think about that. I'm at the top of page 176. Under the stars, the Friday night of all the players joined in the wheel spoke circle, and all eyes were wide open. Who could sleep with the weight of the fate of the town squeezing down all of them, on them? Okay, Will could. But he had three burrito grandes, four slices of watermelon, and a mango after catching batting practice all afternoon. No one expects us to win, said Clifford, lying with his knees up and hands behind his back. I think somebody's going to be real surprised. Ramon agreed. My dad came this morning saying, don't worry, this game doesn't even matter. Sooner or later, this whole place will be houses and eight-lane freeways. I just smiled and said, yeah, dad, we know. That's what the mayor said, too, Frankie added. But when he was watching batting practice today, he was white as a tortilla. Yeah, Cruz agreed. But I think his true color was alabaster. Right, Maria? What are you going to say to him after we ruin his plans? Tom's gut clenched. Hey, look, you guys, Maria answered. Don't get overconfident. Remember, batting practice is one thing, but in a game, especially this one, it's different. There's a lot of pressure. She's right, said Ramon. But I think Cruz and Clifford are too. The way I see it, as long as we think we have a chance, we have a chance. Tom kept silent. His mind was still frozen under the snake eyes of a man named Jones, who loomed above him like a vi viper over a rat. What did he expect Tom to do? Tell Cruz and everyone to throw the game? Tom was just the bench guy, the reserve player. Even if he got into the game, which would only happen if one team was way ahead of the other. He could strike out and make an error or two, but big deal. It would hardly affect the game. Maybe, he thought, he could coach first, tri uh, first and trip everyone as they ran the bases. Or maybe he could go out to the scoreboard with the mirror and shine sunlight into all the batter's eyes. But he hated these thoughts. In fact, he was tired of thinking. Tom, said Cruz, what do you think? Boom, when his heart beat. About what? About the neural receptors inside our brains. What? Okay, then. Are we going to win tomorrow? Oh, I don't know. It's up to you guys. Ah, said Frankie. Wrong answer. Well, he doesn't know. It was Maria coming to Tom's defense. No one does. We spent three days swinging at the same stupid pitch a million times. But it was in the library. What about real life? What about it? asked Clifford. You saw us today. We smashed the chips and dip out of the ball. So? Rachel rust rustled inside her bag as she flipped over to her stomach. I mean, I don't know what happens to us in the library. 
If we got hypnotized or reprogrammed or brainwashed or what, all I know is we can't forget we're human beings. And human beings have control over their thoughts. And as long as we concentrate on doing our best, we shouldn't worry about winning or losing. I'm at the last page, page 178. She paused her voice lower to a whisper. I just believe that when people do things with good intentions, good things happen. Like when Tom and Cruise rode off to see Delgado. But we, we do stuff out of fear. Bad things happen. She looked around. A lot of people are afraid of what might happen tomorrow, but we can't be. Then, whatever happens will turn out okay. Even if we lose? asked Frankie. Even if we lose? I mean, from where we are, losing may look like a total disaster. Like we just accidentally busted down someone's wall. Though he couldn't see her, Tom could hear the smile in her voice. But you know, we only see it from here. How does it look from the hawk's nest? Or from the stars. No one said a word. Everyone, even Tom, searched the night sky, roamed the ether, bouncing around between the moon, the stars, and the eucalyptus trees. From treetop, from the hawk's perch, Tom thought about the game, the town, the hillsides. In a million years, a short time, really in space, space years, would it even matter whether they won or lost? In a thousand? What about a hundred? Who could say? But he knew one thing. Rachel was right. He'd seen it too many times. When he froze up from fear, he did stupid things, like never talking to Doc about the ball field. And when he let his mind fly above the fear, he saw hitting a baseball as just another form of GPS tracking. No matter if his parents got fired and if his family had to move, no matter what trouble Alabaster Jones might cause, Tom determined that tomorrow he would play to win. And now he wondered how he could have considered doing anything else. That's all we had today. Make sure that you complete your six questions in the boxes on the first page. And we will talk about this on Monday. Have a great weekend.